Okay. This is Peter Mayles' A Dog's Life, Chapter 3 in Limbo, starting on page 27. In Limbo. Abandoned. That was the word that came to mind eventually after scanning the empty horizon for a glimpse of the van and its devious owner. I took it as a hint that my services were no longer required at Chateau Despair, and with no pressing appointments, I had plenty of time to take stock and ponder the future. It was a turning point, no doubt about it. And what I've discovered about turning points is that they are what you make of them. There's good and bad, sunshine and shade, bitter and sweet, and so forth. Is the glass half empty or half full? Does every silver lining have a cloud? That sort of thing. As I've mentioned, I'm an optimist by nature, and so I started by considering the bright side. I was free to roam wherever my nose took me. There was no immediate threat of a kick in the ribs or ear-splitting expeditions with a group of armed idiots and my previous lodging and feeding arrangements, as you've seen, could hardly have been worse. To leave those behind was no hardship. There was a problem, however, which began to intrude in the way that problems do. Whatever other abilities I possess, I was not equipped by nature to fend for myself. That's the difference between dogs and cats. My early experience with Hepzibah which I'll describe later, had not endeared me to cats. Throw one of them out in the wilderness, and I have to admit I'd be the first to help. And before you know it, he'd be tucking into a thrush cutlet and making himself free with any nest or rabbit hole that took his fancy. In other words, he would have answered the call of the wild by going native and making a beast of himself. It's always there with cats, you know, that instinct. They're not to be trusted, and they have one or two disgusting personal habits, too, in my opinion, but that's by the way. Ruminating on this, my thoughts turn to the position of the dog in what is loosely called civilized society. I dare say you're familiar with the phrase that has been like a collar around our necks for lo these many years that venerable chestnut about man's best friend, invented, I'm sure, by some sweet old gent with a weakness for the wet nose and the adoring gaze, and I'm all for it. But what people tend to forget when they become misty-eyed and the vapors overtake them is this. The arrangement between man and dog is partly practical. Friendship is all very well. If it weren't for friends, I wouldn't be here after all. But one can't deny the importance of a warm bed copious rations, and the run of a comfortable house. One of my more gifted forebears must have realized this several thousand years ago and come to the conclusion that man was his most convenient support system. We dogs have our skills and talents, it's true, but can we guarantee a regular supply of food? No. Can we construct a snug and weatherproof shelter? No again nor, for all their insufferable arrogance, can cats. And so the wise ancestor made the decision in those primitive times, long before the invention of kennel clubs and poodle parlors, to become a domestic accessory in a human household. Man, being highly susceptible to flattery, chose to take this as a pledge of friendship, brotherhood, true love, and all the rest of it, and so the myth was born. Ever since then, dogs have enjoyed flexible hours, trouble-free board and lodging, and with a little luck and minimal effort, adulation. That's the theory of it at any rate. Although my short experience up until then had been a little lack lacking in all respects, from kindly words to creature comforts. And now things had gone from bad to worse. I had a few apprehensive moments sitting in solitary splendor up there in the hills. And there was even the odd thought about trying to find my way back to the devil I knew, boots and all. Fortunately, the sound of a car distracted me and I made my way down the track to the road, hope springing eternal. 
The car passed me by without slowing down. So did others in the course of the morning, despite amiable nods and leaps of greeting on my part. I experimented by sitting in the middle of the road, but they just drove around me, horns blowing and drivers showing a marked lack of sympathy. Such events put a strain on one's faith in human nature after a time. But finally, it occurred to me that my luck might change if I could catch people on foot. You can reason with people on foot, which you can't when they're rushing past at 50 miles an hour. There's no give and take with cars, if you know what I mean. And so I decided to find some pedestrians. It was easier said than done because my old hunting companion had chosen to drop me off in a spot that resembled what I've heard about New Zealand, trees, bushes, mountains, and very little else. A joy for those who like the unspoiled vista, I suppose, but not encouraging for the lonely traveler in search of company and succor. Succor, new one for me. And so, with the wind in my face, I set off to see if I could find civilization. The hours passed, and it must have been mid-afternoon when I first picked up a faint, familiar whiff of drains and diesel fumes. For you, perhaps, these have no particular significance, and even less allure, but to me, they spelled people. Sure enough, from the top of the hill, from the top of the next hill, I could see a group of old stone buildings. And as I came closer, I was able to make out signs of activity, hustle and bustle, and the sound of voices. Not unlike ants, really, but noisier. You must remember that my previous experience of human habitations had been limited to the single shabby ruin where I was born. And so this was a revelation to me. Dozens of houses and presumably hundreds of people. Somewhere among them, I felt sure was my future soulmate. It is delusions like this to help you put one paw in front of the other at the end of a hard day. The village seemed enormous to me. Streets leading off in all directions, strange and wonderful aromas on every breeze, people strolling around in that aimless way they do when they have nothing much on their minds except what's for dinner. A group of them had stopped to jabber at one another on a corner, and this is where I learned a useful lesson in survival. People don't seem to be able to talk with their hands full. Don't ask me why, but when two or three of them get together to discuss the problems of the world, down go the bags and baskets on the ground, conveniently placed for those of my height to investigate. My head would become somewhere, my head would come somewhere between your knee and your waist and comfortably over the top of any unattended basket. One shouldn't hesitate when opportunity knocks, and so I rescued a protruding baguette and retired with it to the shelter of a table outside of the village cafe. I had just finished the final crumbs and was considering a return swoop on the basket when a hand came into view. It patted me on the head, disappeared, and came back holding a lump of sugar. I looked up to see a young couple at the next table beaming at me and making those faintly ridiculous sounds that humans always imagine speak volumes to the canine ear. They do the same with babies too, I've noticed. But the tone of voice was welcoming, and a friendly hand is a pleasant change from a booted foot, and so I made myself agreeable. Well, you'd have thought they'd never seen a dog before. More cooing, pats on the head, and sugar lumps coming down and thick and fast, all the indications of love at first sight. Being a novice at the time, I took this as an invitation to follow them when they left the cafe, and I trotted along behind them, thinking, I won't deny it, that a soft bed and a new life were just around the corner. Call me naive if you like, but since my experience of human behavior had been limited to abuse of one sort or another, I was unused to kindness and assumed more than I should have. Trouble often starts, I've now learned, when the friendly act is taken at face value. I had reason to believe, or so I thought, that my encounter with these young persons at the cafe was the beginning of a wonderful relationship. Alas, they didn't see it like that, and when we reached their car, there was a certain amount of embarrassed shuffling while I attempted to get in with them, ending with a firm shove outward 
and the door slamming a few inches north of my nose. There's a moral here somewhere about strangers bearing gifts, and I can be philosophical about it now, but it was a distinct setback at the time. A lesser dog may have despaired. I've known spaniels, for instance, who have a tendency to collapse, roll over, and wave their legs in the air at the first hint of adversity. Not me. Resilience, that's the thing, onward and upward. And so I decided to cheer myself up, as people frequently do, so I hear, by going shopping. Working my way down the street, I was stopped in my tracks by the scent of heaven coming from an open doorway. Fresh, raw meat pork chops, legs of lamb, homemade sausage, tripe and liver, marrow bones, beef, and not a soul to be seen when I followed my nose inside. The drowsy hum of a television came from a room at the back, but apart from that, it was as quiet as the grave. I decided to cheer myself up by going shopping. I couldn't even hear the scuff of my paws on the sawdust covered floor as I made my way towards the profusion of delights arranged on a scrubbed wooden table. I thought I'd browse for a moment or two before making my final selection, not realizing that the indecisive shopper often misses the best opportunities. But I was limited to what I could carry in my mouth and I didn't want to snatch a piece of scrag end off the table if there was a chance of steak. It's called the exercise of infer informed choice. A fat lot of good it did me as events turned out. A brace of pigs trotters had caught my eye and I was deliberating between them and a handsome cut of veal when there was an almighty bellow from the back of the shop. Enter the butcher, eyes popping with fury as he looked around for reinforcements. Luckily, the first weapon within reach was a broom rather than a bone saw or a cleaver. And he wasn't too handy with that, knocking over a row of glass jars, confit of duck as I recall, in his eagerness to make contact with me. It helped to spoil his aim and I managed to jump over the debris and make my departure with no more than a glancing whack around the hindquarters. I should never have dithered he who hesitates stays hungry. I pass this on as something to bear in mind when you're shopping. It was time to reconsider my tactics. If the episode with the butcher was anything to go by, there was a certain prejudice in the village shops towards dogs. Remarkable when you think of the instant havoc that children can cause, and I've never known them to be threatened with any offensive weapons, but there you are. One rule for some and one rule for others. And then it struck me as I watched a man and a mongrel leaving the bakery without being assaulted. Maybe it wasn't all dogs that brought out the warlike spirit. Maybe it was just unaccompanied dogs. I went up the street to the epicery and waited outside to put plan B into action. Like many great ideas, it was simple. I would attach myself temporarily to a customer entering the premises. Once inside, we would part company to attend our respective errands, and I would leave fully laden while my personal shopper distracted the proprietor. It seemed to be foolproof. There were some encouraging smells coming from inside the epicery, not quite the range and red-blooded richness of the butcher shop, but more than enough to set the imagination humming. And it was with a sharp sense of anticipation that I scanned the street for a likely accomplice. I had never seen so many people before, and I think my lifelong interest in human behavior started on that late afternoon so long ago. All shapes, all ages, all sizes, jostling along together without any of the curiosity about one another that a group of dogs would display, no sniffling, no circling, no ceremonial leg lifting. Very little of what I'd call social contact, apart from the occasional nod of the head or the clutching of hands. I'm used to it now, of course, but I remember thinking how strange it was, this lack of interest. Something to do with urban overcrowding, I shouldn't wonder. It must dull the senses. 
I was so taken up with watching the passing parade that I jumped when I saw the woman's hand pat me on the head. Looking up, I saw an empty shopping basket and a smiling face. And then she'd gone through the doorway and into the fragrant room of the epicerie. Seize the moment, I said to myself, and like a shadow, I was there behind her, giving my best impersonation of an accompanied dog on an official on official business. It was a proper epicerie, the traditional kind. So many of them these days stock nothing more than cans and boxes and mysterious lumps wrapped in plastic. But here was real food, most of it naked. Slabs of cheese, mountain sausage, cured hams, and a long row of cooked dishes. The French don't stint themselves, as you know, and there was everything from crep crepnets of stuffed chicken to terrines that made my eyes water. My companion stopped in front of the vegetables, which have never held any interest for me, and I slipped up the narrow aisle, disregarding the brief temptation of the biscuit section as I approached the back of the shop. This was where the treasures were displayed, and I was very taken by the homemade lasagna. But there was not a moment to be lost in contemplation. After my previous experience, Shay the butcher, I wasn't about to dawdle and I was at full stretch on the hind legs, front paws on the counter, and jaws about to close in on a kilo of the best smoked ham when all hell broke loose down below. If you were feeling generous, you might have described the source of the problem as another dog, a spindly little object knee high to a rat with an absurd tightly curled tail that looked like a worm in torment and a piercing falsetto yap fit to wake the dead. For a moment, I thought, I thought he'd caught his personals in the ham slicer, but it was merely his miserable travesty of a bark. Hungry as I was, it was impossible to deal with the ham when he started to take flying bites out of my ankle. And it was while I was trying to shake him off that a mountain on legs, wearing a sour expression in an apron, appeared from the back to join in. I vaguely remember a rolling pin too. All in all, it seemed unwise to linger. So much for the welcome I received from the village shopkeepers. And all I can say is that you shouldn't trust those of postcards. You shouldn't trust those postcards of jolly natives simpering into the camera. The two I met that day would have given Genghis Khan nightmares. They say he used to eat dogs, you know, when he ran short. I suppose we've made progress since then. I returned to my previous refuge under the cafe table and reflected. One rejection and two attempts on my life in return for a small loaf of bread and a handful of sugar lumps. The afternoon had not been an outstanding triumph, and now the shadows were lengthening. Evening was drawing nigh, and I was still no closer to bed and board than I had been when the day started. Tomorrow would bring new joys and opportunities, I felt sure. But in the meantime, there was the problem of where to spend the night. To stay under the table or to seek shelter in the great unknown, that was the question. It was answered by the cafe owner, armed with the ever-present broom that all villagers seemed to keep by their sides, presumably, presumably in case of invasion. He had come out to sweep the droppings of the day from under the tables and out into the street, for the general enjoyment of the public, I imagine. As he worked his way toward me, our eyes met. The broom was raised to the attack position. I would like to have contributed a small mark of appreciation for the warmth of his greeting, but there was no time for even a swift raising of the leg. Yet again, I left in haste to seek peace in the countryside. I was well clear of the village, musing on my latest taste of the milk of human kindness when my nose was caught by a definite ripeness in the air. It was coming from the end of a narrow track where a large bin had been overturned, its contents scattered on the grass. I came closer, nostrils twitching, and found that the problem of dinner had been solved. I studied the menu. It never ceases to amaze me what people throw away. 
the problem of dinner had been solved. Bones, crusts, giblets, perfectly serviceable sardines, all these and more were set like jewels among the empty cans and paper and plastic. Pushing aside a discarded shoe, I was about to dust off the first course, a morsel of chicken skin and angelé, if memory serves, when I heard a growl. In fact, it was more like a snarl, unwelcoming rather than cheerful anyway. I looked up to see the front half of a dog poking out of the bin, lips drawn back, teeth bared, hackles on red alert, the very picture of Fido defending hearth and home. I like to think that I'm not without courage, particularly when the opposition is quite clearly old, infirm, and considerably smaller than me, all of which he was. And so I tried to ignore him while I finished off the chicken and moved on to some rather good cheese rind. But as I'm sure you found, it's not easy to enjoy your food when there's a constant and very tiresome whining going on a short distance from your ear. I've heard the same said about dinner parties that include investment bankers. You will know better than I, but apparently they have a compulsion to drone on. So it was with our friend in the bin. However, apart from that small irritation, I did quite well for myself thus sufficiently restored to consider the question of sleeping arrangements in a more hopeful light. After a few minutes of exploration, a distinct pattern emerged. Leading off the village road, every few hundred yards on either side were small tracks, each with a house at the end. And every track seemed to have its own bin, similar to the one my peevish dining companion had occupied. Applying the laws of logic, I deduced that all of these bins would contain an edible selection of one kind or another, nothing to make the ears stand up perhaps, but enough to keep body and soul together, unguarded and easily available. Sniffing confirmed my theory, and I remember feeling quite gratified that brain and nose were working as one for the greater good of the stomach. With tomorrow's breakfast taken care of, I turned my attentions to the night's lodging, and here I begun to run, began to run into some unexpected obstacles. I must have visited half a dozen houses with a view to, to curling up for a few peaceful hours in an outbuilding. But wherever I went, I was met by a volley of threats, cries of alarm, and sounds of general disapproval. Not in this case from people, but from my own kind. Every establishment had at least two resident dogs and from the fuss they were making, you'd have thought I was trying to steal the family silver. Fortunately, most of them were attached by chain or rope to some immovable object. This hampered their murderous instincts, and I was able to put them in their place by marking their territory, leg raised just out of range of their slavering jaws. That is considered an insult, you know, on par with making a dispar disparaging remarks about someone's poor taste in curtains. And I must say it drove them into a frenzy. One of them, a big mangy piece of work with outsized teeth, threw himself against his chain so violently in his enthusiasm to get at me that he must have ruptured his vocal cords. His bark suddenly became a squeak and he looked distinctly embarrassed served him right. But these fleeting amusements weren't getting me any closer to a good night's rest. It had been a long, eventful, and instructive day, and I was tired enough not to be too particular about where I lay my head. As long as it was well away from brooms and jaws, it would do. I tried one last house, set off another hysterical symphony of howls and barking, and dug in for the night among the bushes at the end, edge of the forest. The romantic notion of the forest, as I expect you know, is one of tranquil glades and leafy nooks, Mother Nature's heaven, Mother Nature's haven of calm, a place for quiet repose. You should try living there as I did over the next few weeks. My abiding memory of the forest is the noise, the screech of birds and their hideous at, uh, and their hideous dawn chorus first thing in the morning, 
hunters and their guns during the day, the endless rustling and slithering of nocturnal creatures, owls holding forth all through the night. The whole arrangement is my idea of bedlam. One tosses and turns, longing for unbroken slumber. It reached the stage where I started to make regular visits to the village to get some relief from the din. As long as I maintained a prudent distance from the butcher and my other sparring partner in the epicery, I had the run of the place and was left to loiter in peace. In fact, one or two of the less barbaric villagers began to recognize me and proffer the hand of friendship. But as before, the hand was withdrawn as soon as I tried to convert it into something more permanent. And then when the vagabond's life was becoming less enjoyable by the day and even less enjoyable by night, fate intervened. It was a milestone or a turning point or maybe even both. Anyway, I'll tell you what happened and you can judge for yourself. I was on my way to the village after a night in the forest when the entire owl population seemed to have chosen my little corner as the place to have an argument. Or it might have been the mating season, although I'm not too sound on owls and their habits, so I couldn't say for sure. Whatever the reason, it was a shrill and sleepless night, and I was feeling very much worse for the wear as I walked along the road. Listless and wane, wan, you might say, with hardly any of my customary bounce and esprit. I heard a car behind me and hopped into the ditch to let it pass, but it stopped. Out stepped the lady driver, and I could tell at once she was a kindred spirit by one very simple act. Instead of peering at me from a great height, she crouched down so that our faces were more or less on the same level. It may seem like a small thing to you, but to a dog, it indicates a great deal. Sympathy, a desire to communicate on an equal basis, and let's not forget plain good manners. Look at it this way. If you were constantly being addressed by someone squinting down his nose at, your, at you from four feet above your head, you wouldn't care for it. A lack of common courtesy, you'd think, and you'd be quite right. So you can understand why I responded to Madam's overtures with vigorous motions of the tail, tail and body, small cries of rapture, and a friendly paw on her knee. We stayed like this for several minutes, communing by the side of the ditch, and then she seemed to reach a decision. She opened the door of the car. My ears drooped and my spirits fell because previous experience had led me to recognize this as the prelude to a hasty farewell with the car going off into the sunset and yours truly left to carry on as before, the solitary wanderer. But not this time. I was invited to get in, which I did, making myself as un unobtrusive as possible on the floor. Imagine my surprise, not to mention the sudden rush of hope rekindled when I was encouraged to sit on the seat next to my new best friend. We all have our ways of showing enthusiasm and excitement. Humans caper about and slap one another on the back when they feel it's called for. I prefer to choose something, not in an aggressive manner, you understand, but just to demonstrate approval of the current situation. And so I got to work on a convenient seatbelt as we drove away from the village, back along the road, and turned up a track between two fields of vines. It led to a house not unlike some of the others that I had visited during the past weeks, even down to the familiar sound of other dogs baying for my blood. There were two of them, and they weren't tied up either, as I saw from the safety of the passenger seat. It took some coaxing from the madame to get me out of the car and introduce me to the welcoming committee. But to my relief, they were both bitches, a shaggy old biddy with a distant resemblance to a hunting dog and a black Labrador with a limp. They seemed harmless enough. And once the formalities were completed, they pottered off to collapse in the garden. 
by this time, I was allowing myself to feel that there, that there might be more on the program of events than just a visit. Madame has a thoughtful look in her eye as she picked fragments of masticated seatbelt from my whiskers and took me indoors, murmuring something about the other member of the household. Let it not be a cat, I remember thinking to myself or a homicidal case wearing boots and carrying a gun. Funny how those thoughts flash through the mind during decisive moments in one's life. It turned out to be the other half of the management, unarmed and barefoot, which was a good start and looking slightly bemused. We exchanged pleasantries, but I could sense that he didn't entirely share Madame's feelings because they went off into a corner for a, a tete a tete, leaving me to look at my surroundings. I'm no great judge of property from any point of view but my own, but it appeared to be quite adequate for my requirements, garden front and back, the untamed wilderness, a comfortable distance behind the house, rugs on the floor, and the scent of two bitches wherever I went. It was obvious that they didn't sleep rough. All in all, it would do me very well. And as there were two dogs in residence already, what difference would a third make? I went across to where the management conference was taking place and cocked an ear. There appeared to be two issues under discussion with Madame firmly on my side and the other half caught somewhere between pro and con. Were three dogs too many? And if not, how and where would I fit in? There was a half-hearted argument put forward that my previous owner should be found, but Madame knocked that one smartly on the head, letting fly in an anguish, anguish style about ill treatment, undernourishment, and lack of bedtime privileges. Then she moved on to more personal comments about my acne, protruding bones, and the overall state of disrepair, ending with a plea on my behalf for intensive care and attention. It was music to my ears, and I moved over to lean against her leg as a gesture of solidarity. She won in the end, bless her. Wives usually do, I've noticed. And it was agreed that I would stay for a trial period. Well, I knew what that meant. If I kept my nose clean, deferred politely to the two bitches, and watched my step with the other half, I was in. I remember as though it were yesterday, rolling on the grass after my first decent meal for weeks, the management watching from the doorway, the sun on my belly, and all well with the world. What a moment. That's the end of chapter three. I wanna go back and look up the French word that was least familiar to me. I'm gonna use Google to pronounce it for me. French words are tricky, I, th I think. I bet if I knew the rules, they wouldn't be. Okay. How to pronounce this word. Let's try that again. Elepissary. Elepissary. What does it mean? Grocery. The French word for grocery. Learn something new every day. Chapter four, page 49. Night maneuvers and a confrontation with hygiene. The rest of that day confirmed my first impressions and it looked very much as though I had fallen on my feet. 
In the afternoon, we took a stroll along the path behind the house, and I began to change my views about the forest. It had certain merits if used for purely recreational purposes. An excellent selection of trees, small and terrified creatures scuttling off as one pounced on them, bosky and intriguing sounds in the undergrowth. I even came across the mature corpse of a pigeon, which I rolled in for several minutes, paying special attention to those hard to reach areas at the back of the neck and behind the ears. All in all, an amusing place to visit the forest. I wouldn't want to live there, of course, and now I didn't have to. We returned to the house and there was more food. I wasn't used to such abundance. And after eating, it was all I could do to stagger under the table for a siesta, using the well-upholstered Labrador as a pillow. By the time I woke up, darkness had fallen. Still drowsy, I gradually became aware of whispered discussions between the management, complimenting themselves, I hope, on the good fortune that had led me to their door. In fact, the cocked ear then picked up a different and rather ominous message. My sleeping arrangements were under review, and there seemed to be a quite unnecessary concern about allowing me to remain in the house. I think the lingering scent of well-rotten pigeon around my neck and shoulders may have come into it, and there was some mention from the other half about leaving me free to return to my previous address if I wanted to, I thought I'd made it clear that I was quite content and not to be disturbed under the table, but people can be remarkably insensitive at times. And I was hustled into the night and taken to an outbuilding by the side of the house. I admit that it was an improvement over what I'd been used to. Thick blanket, bowl of water, bedtime biscuits, pats of affection and expressions of goodwill, but it wasn't indoors and indoors was where I wanted to be, head resting on a stout Labrador, sleeping the sleep of one of the family. But tonight, for some reason, wasn't the night, and as the lights went out, I was left staring at the stars through the open door of my modest chamber. I mused, as one does at moments like this, on the bewildering turns life can take, up one minute, down the next, so near and yet so far, the rich tapestry of personal experience and so forth. What would Proust have done in similar circumstances? I wondered. Ball for mother, I suppose, but then he wouldn't have been in an outbuilding in the first place. He was always indoors, as I remember. I thought it was worth trying one or two piteous howls, complete with sobbing vi vibrato at the end, and waited to see if the lights would go on. Sure enough, they did, and out came the management, full of concern, in case I'd been savaged in my bed by a militant field mouse. When they found me unscathed and ready to accompany back, them back into the house, the mood of sympathy changed. Stern words passed, and I was told to settle down. There are occasions when argument is fruitless. I'm told that's the case when dealing with plumbers and lawyers, and I sensed that this was one of them. I heaved a sigh, and although my sighs are works of art, long and wistful and infinitely touching, this one had no effect at all. Two hearts of stone wrapped in their dressing gowns left me to my solitary devices. I was still wondering how I could convince them of the error of their ways when I dozed off. You know, how it is sometime, you know how it is sometimes when you sleep on the problem? The subconscious gets to work, worrying away through the small hours, and in the morning, voila, the solution presents itself. That's exactly what happened to me because I awoke with a plan. Two hearts of stone wrapped in their dressing gowns. The mistake I had made, obviously, was in overestimating human intelligence. By and large, one cannot deny certain of mankind's achievements, such as
such as the invention of lamb chops and central heating. But many people are strangely unreceptive to nuance. The hint, the diplomatic nudge, the oblique statement. These very often pass straight over their heads and a man and dog find themselves looking at, it, at each other through a fog of incomprehension. Thus it was with the management and myself. Delightful and welcoming they certainly were, but not, it seemed, too quick on the uptake. Clearer signals were called for, but they needed to be executed with some delicacy. You can be too blunt sometimes, and it can end in tears, as a bull terrier of my acquaintance discovered when he started eating furniture because he felt unloved. No, finesse is the thing. And I think you'll agree that my scheme was a model of cunning and charm. There was a pleasant, crisp feeling to the air as I emerged from my boudoir with just enough breeze to carry an interesting variety of neighborhood aromas to the nose. I detected other dogs over to the east, mixed with the tantalizing smell of live chickens, and I made a mental note to pay them a visit as soon as domestic matters had been settled. The chicken, you see, is that happy combination of sport and nourishment. She runs and clucks in the most gratifying way when chased, and is also very tasty once the feathers have been dealt with. A youthful bird, unlike most of them. With a plan firmly in place, I went up to the house. It was silent when I put my ear to the door. Shutters closed no hint of activity within. I had decided against barking in favor of less conventional methods, and I started scratching at the base of the door. It took a few minutes, but eventually I succeeded in rousing the two bitches, who should have been up and about by this time, as it was well past dawn. And they raised their heads like a couple of second-rate sopranos, and began to howl and carry on in fine style, which was exactly what I wanted. They would incur the full weight of disapproval for waking the household, and I would be sitting outside, lip sealed, good as gold and quiet as a stump. It wasn't long before the door opened and out rushed the two old girls in a state of high excitement, followed by the management, rubbing their eyes and blinking in the morning sun. Step one successfully completed. Once I was sure I had their full attention, I went back to the outbuilding, collected my blanket, and dragged it up to the door, wagging all the while. There, I thought to myself, if that doesn't indicate a, sin a sincere desire to cross the threshold, I don't know what will. But to be on the safe side, I shimmied over to Madame, caught hold of her wrist gently in my jaws, and pulled her back into the house, making small and persuasive sounds as we went. I let go of her wrist, took up, sitting, took up a sitting position under the table, back straight, paws together, head to one side, the docile and well-mannered hound, and awaited developments. Both of them squatted down in front of me, and I gave them another short chorus of muted squeals. They were about to melt, I could tell, when I noticed Madame wrinkling her nose. And then she used a word that meant nothing to me at the time. Toiletage. Well, for all I knew in those days, it could have been an exotic breakfast cereal or the name of her mother-in-law. So I merely sat tight and tried to convey enthusiasm as best I could. In the light of subsequent experience, I might have been better advised to keep my distance until the persistent scent of dead pigeon had worn off. But we can be all, but we can all be wise after the event. I noticed Madame wrinkling her nose. The important thing was that both Blanket and I were permitted to stay in the house. And I took this to be a great step forward. I bustled helpfully about the kitchen with the rest of them while breakfast was being prepared and eaten. And I was of two minds as to staying under the table or risking a turn outside in the garden when I was summoned to the car. It appeared that the other half and I were going on an expedition. 
We arrived at a village that I vaguely remembered from my travels and stopped outside a house that, even from a distance, had the noticeably strong and unappealing smell of disinfectant about it. This became worse as we went indoors and I was instinctively getting into reverse to back out when I was gripped for and aft by two meaty young women taken into the chamber of horrors and lifted bodily into a bath. Traumatic is the only word to describe what happened next. Drenched with water, smeared with soap, rinsed and soaked and rinsed again. And that was just the overture. There followed an interminable session with a miniature lawnmower and then an attack by scissors, snipping away at ears, mustache, tail, and other sensitive regions. The final indignity was a dusting with powder that smelled like a mixture of evening in Paris and weed killer. Naked, perfumed, and highly embarrassed, I was at last delivered to the waiting room for collection. A poodle was there, I remember, looking down at me from the confines of her mistress's handbag and smirking in that way they do when they know they're safely out of range. You wait, I said to myself. By the time they finish with you, there won't be anything left but a yap and four paws. I'm not too partial to poodles, as you can probably gather, but I did feel a twinge of sympathy for her. So that was toiletage. As far as I'm concerned, it ranks with kennels, obedience classes, and rectal thermometers, and supervised celibacy as one of man's great mistakes. But then it was time for another surprise. I was driven back to the house and greeted as if I'd won the national lottery. Biscuits, endless padding, cries of delight and admiration, photographs, the four course heroes welcome, all of which I found rather puzzling. It had only been a shave and a shampoo after all, even if it had been deeply unpleasant. Did these ecstatic demonstrations take place each morning after ablutions in the management's bathroom? I wouldn't rule it out. They have an odd liking for hygiene. The morning's finale brought a tear to the eye. The other half went back to the car and returned to the house carrying a large circular basket, which he placed by the kitchen. Into the basket went my, went my blanket, and that's when it dawned on me. The ghastly ordeal had not been in vain. It was my passport to the joys of indoors. I could take up my position as Barker in Chief, permanent resident, and defender of the premises against trespassing lizards and things that go bump in the night. No more subsistence living, no more boots to the ribs, a life of privilege. Lux evolto, I have to have looked that one up, stretched before me. It was a heady realization, and I thought of celebrating with a quick dive into the remains of the dead pigeon to get rid of the odor of cleanliness that clung to me, but I decided against it. If the management preferred the sanitary me, that's how I'd stay. Until tomorrow, at any rate. Pigeons always improve with age. I'm going to look up this other French term. L-U-X-E-E-T-V-O-L-U-T-E. Oh, an oil painting. Oh, no. English translation. Luxury, richness, voluptuousness. How to pronounce it? They're all the Matisse painting. Luxen le volupté. Lux calme et volupté. Oh, that has 
the word calm in it as well. Okay, that's the end of chapter four. So we ended on page 57. Um, and then next week we'll dive into chapter five, which starts on page 59 with name of a dog.